Hello, chemistry students. This is Professor Sean McMahon, and this is lecture two for chapter seven in our general chemistry introductory level course. In chapter seven, we are discussing chemical reactions and the quantities and determination of chemical reactions. And in the first lecture, we covered of the five basic types, the three. We also discussed how to balance uh, equations and how we're going to utilize nomenclature to write out our chemical reactions. So as a reminder, <clears throat> in the last uh, lecture, we covered combination reactions, combustion reactions, and decomposition. So we are going to continue our discussion with double displacement and single displacement or replacement. Those are used interchangeably. And in these reactions, we'll see that they are also covered in aqueous solutions. So we will do a review on what exactly it means to be soluble. And we will also cover a topic called solubility rules. But let's just go straight into it. So let's start with our double displacement. There are actually two types of double displacements. There are neutralization double displacements, and there are precipitations but they follow the same patterns, okay? So the general equation of a double displacement is I have two compounds where I have a switching of partners and I produce two new compounds. <clears throat> so with neutralizations, you typically have an acid and a base. We know acids because they're gonna have the proton or the hydrogen ion. And we know bases because they have hydroxides. Those are going to combine to produce a neutral water compound. I like to write water in neutralization reactions as HOH because essentially that's what it is. It's an H plus and an OH minus coming together to produce an HOH or H2O molecule. So double displacement Neutralization is a little more specific because we have the acid, we have the base, we produce water and salt. So in this case, let's say your acid is hydrochloric acid. What you have to realize is with hydrochloric acid, when I throw it in water, that's what the aqueous means. It means it's been thrown in water. It separates into its two ions, the chloride ion and the proton. The sodium hydroxide actually separates into its sodium ions and its hydroxide ions. So the reason why I use the term do -si do is what I actually do is I switch. So when I break the ions up, like I just did here, it's a lot easier to see the switching. And I see that the H plus and the OH combine to produce water, the H2O, but I write it as H plus OH minus HOH. And the salt, I can see right here, the Na plus and the chloride minus. If I crisscross, it's a one-to-one -one ratio and it's aqueous and it's dissolved. So that's a double displacement because I had two couples. Here's one couple, here's another. And they literally do a do -si do So in general, and I apologize for this. Let me erase all that. A salt is just a general term for an ionic compound. So typically, because you have an acid and a base, the salt is just going to be an ionic compound. It doesn't have to be sodium chloride. It can be any ionic compound. They still refer to it as a salt. So if you want to have a really generic term, right, for the acid-base water and salt, you basically have an acid, and I'm writing it as HA. Why? Because all of these have protons. And then whether they're a binary acid or a oxy acid, the hydrogens are first. Your bases have these hydroxides. So a lot of times they write BOH. Then to split it apart, you can think of it as an H plus some non-metal anion, so negative, plus some cation and hydroxide switching 
to give me water and a salt. So in this case, it would be BA. <clears throat> so you, you could really pick a number of these and let's do that. I'm gonna pick two of these. And I want us to be able to determine the products with the correct formula and then balance it. So I'm gonna pick a nitric acid solution. How do I know it's an acid? Well, I know the name and there's an H in front. And for my base, I'm gonna pick calcium hydroxide. Now, how do I know it's a base? The hydroxide. Now, to, I know the formula for water, okay? It's gonna be HOH. But to predict the formula of the salt, it actually helps me break up the ions in the acid and base. So I know I'm gonna produce the H plus and a nitrate, because that's where the nitric acid comes from. And then I'm gonna produce calcium, but calcium has a two plus charge, <clears throat> and because that's in group two, and that's why the hydroxide and calcium hydroxide, I need two of them, because it's a minus one. So when I do the dosi -si do here, I see that the water is HOH, and it's a liquid, but the salt, I need to be careful. It's a calcium two plus and a nitrate minus one. So I need two nitrates. So it's calcium NO3 two aqueous. So that's why I like separating it out so I can predict the correct formula for the salt. I leave it as HOH because now I need to balance this, okay? So when I balance this, I'm gonna follow my rules. First metals, one calcium, one calcium. Then non-metals, okay? So I'm gonna save hydrogen last, but I have these polyatomics, right? So here I have nitrate, I have one. There's two on this side, on the product side. So on the reactant side, there's one nitrate. On the products, there's two. So I need to put a two here to balance the nitrates. Then I go to my hydroxide, there's two. Now remember, I wrote water as HOH, and I know that the calcium hydroxide has two hydroxides, but the water, there's only one, so I need to put a two here. And now that I save hydrogen for last, I see that I have two hydrogen and I have two hydrogen. So now I have a balanced equation. So that's essentially a double displacement, right? I basically took two nitric acids in solution, combined it with calcium hydroxide in solution to produce two water molecules and a salt. Okay, so that's what neutralization reactions are. But there's another double displacement and it's basically called precipitation. It's where you form a precipitate. And I don't know if you remember, but I said a precipitate is a fancy way of saying a solid. So in this example, we have silver nitrate, which is a solution, potassium chloride, which is a solution. Again, I have a switching of partners and I produce silver chloride and potassium nitrate. The potassium nitrate stays as separate ions in solution, but the silver chloride produces a precipitate. So that's a precipitation. It's a double displacement, it's precipitation. How are you gonna be able to determine which one is a solid if it's not given to you? You're gonna see that there's a set of rules to let you know when a salt is insoluble, meaning it doesn't dissolve in water. But first, let's just kind of continue with double displacements. So 
Here's the reaction. Aqueous barium chloride. So barium is a two plus, chloride is a minus one. So if I crisscross, I should get barium chloride and it's aqueous. Sodium sulfate, sodium's a plus one. Sulfate's a SO4 two minus. So if I crisscross, I should get two sodiums per one sulfate, and it's also aqueous. So aqueous barium chloride reacts with aqueous sodium sulfate as follows. So what I noticed is I was right with my predictions with the barium chloride and the sodium sulfate. Now, how can I predict the products? Well, barium's two plus, chloride's minus one, Sodium's plus one, sulfate's two minus. If I do -si do I get sodium chloride, and the barium's two plus, sulfate's two minus, and the barium sulfate. To balance this, I would go first metals, one barium, one barium, two sodium, only one here, so I put its coefficient of two, two chlorine, two chlorine, one sulfate, one sulfate, it's balanced. So I'm gonna use something called solubility rules to figure out that is the barium sulfate that's a solid and not the sodium chloride. So from the solubility rules, you'll be, see that the barium sulfate is what's insoluble. So with aqueous sodium chloride and aqueous lithium nitrate, Again, we're gonna have the do -si do So we get sodium nitrate, lithium chloride. The thing is they're both aqueous. And what that means is they're both soluble in water. So they will not combine to produce a solid. The ions will stay separate. So, Typically what you do when that's the case, you would write no reaction. So if you don't form a precipitate, you could just write no reaction. In lab, this would be easy. You would take two clear liquids, combine them. There'd be no precipitate. You could touch, if heat was released, it's probably evidence of a reaction, probably neutralization. If no heat's released, no reaction. But we're gonna use solubility rules to show that both sodium nitrate and lithium chloride are actually soluble. And that's how we know they don't form a precipitate or a water molecule. And we could see easily that water by doing the dosi -si -do, doesn't produce, isn't produced. So what's happening in a precipitation? Well, like I said, there's an exchanging, but what happens is I actually produce a solid because once the ions are in water and they separate, they want to be separate because they get surrounded by the water molecules. But if they have a higher affinity for another ion that's dissolved in solution, they will precipitate out. So for example, if I do potassium iodide, if I took that salt, throw it in water, the potassium and the iodide like to separate and get surrounded by water because the water surrounding it stabilizes the charge. It'd be the same if I take the lead too and the nitrate. And then when I do the do -si do that's why I say I need two of the iodides or one lead too, but the potassium nitrate's one to one. These actually, you could write this out more accurately as separate ions because they don't come together to produce anything. They like being separate. But when the lead two sees the iodide, it prefers the iodide than the water and it precipitates out, it gives me a solid, okay? So I have to have a balanced equation. And how do I do that? Well, I start with metals, okay? So I have one potassium on the reactants, one in the product. One lead in the reactants, one lead in the product. Then I go to the nitrates. 
or actually I'd go to iodine, one iodine in the reactant, I have two in the product. So now I need to put a two. And when I do that, I need two potassiums. So I have to come over here and do that. And now I have two nitrates because there's a two and one nitrate and then two nitrates because of that subscript I'm balanced. So that's balancing and helping you predict, but really we're identifying what type of reaction is this? This is a double displacement or double replacement. It's used interchangeably. So we have two types, the neutralization where you add acid and a base, salt and water. So an example, again, H2SO4 aqueous, lithium hydroxide aqueous. Cool. How do I know that this is an acid and a base? Well, this is sulfuric acid. There's an H plus in front. This is lithium hydroxide. It's a base. So what should I do? Separate them, because that's what would happen. That's what aqueous means. The ions split apart. But now that the ions are splitting apart, so if I had this in a test tube and this in a test tube, they're separate. Right, so the lithium and the hydroxide in test tube number two are happy. They're like, ah, oh, I'm surrounded by water. But if I put them together in a beaker now, now the H plus and the hydroxide see each other and they're like, hey, wait a second. I, I'm gonna combine with you and I'm gonna produce water, HOH. And then the lithium, and the sulfate, we just write the formula to help balance the equation, but it's dissolved. It's really still separate. So in actuality, I could write that out. And in some classes, they have you do this. It's called total ionic and net ionic. We don't do it for this class, but basically you would actually write these out as separate ions. And then now we would have to balance it. So I would start one lithium, there's two lithium, so I'd put a two there. One sulfate, one sulfate. Then I would see that I have two hydroxides. So I only have one here, so I'd put a two. Two hydrogens, two hydrogens, I'm balanced. So for a precipitation, you know, you might have like a silver nitrate and a potassium chloride. Those are my two salts and they're aqueous. What does that mean? When I throw them in water, they separate. That's if I have them separate, but if I put them together, now the silver and the chloride, are, they're, they like each other, right? So I form a precipitate, silver chloride. And then the potassium nitrate will stay aqueous, dissolved. They're actually separate, but we don't do it that way. We just, to help us balance, we just write it as a molecular formula. And when we balance this, we'll see that everything's balanced. So I have one silver on the reactants, one on the product, one potassium in the reactants, one on the product, one chloride, one chloride, one nitrate, one nitrate. So here's another example that we already did and it's showing. And it's nice here because we see, you know, we have this clear solution of potassium nitrate, which is aqueous. Then we have this clear solution of potassium iodine that we're delivering to the potassium to, or I'm sorry, we're delivering the potassium iodide to the lead to nitrate solution. So this is probably a pipette or a burette tip. And when they come in contact, that lead to, that's an ionized form, sees that iodide and they have a stronger affinity than being separate in the water. And they form this yellow precipitate, which is your potassium or lead to iodide, I'm sorry. So in lab, it's really easy to see a precipitation. You combine the two and you see the solid. It's not as easy, you know, when you're 
not in lab. So how could you, if you're not in lab and you're not observing a precipitate, predict if a precipitate is going to be formed? You got to use solubility rules. Okay. So before I actually go into solubility rules, double displacement is an aqueous reaction. Why? I'm taking solutions and combining them. Okay. So most of chemistry is water based and it's solution chemistry. An aqueous solution is homogeneous because it evenly distributes through the water. When you have ionic compounds like sodium chloride, they break apart into their respective ions because they like being surrounded by the water molecule. It's actually called solvation, but we are going to call it dissociation, okay? Dissolving. So the way that works is if I throw sodium chloride in water, and, and with sodium chloride, okay, that's just the ratio. It's one to one. But there's no molecule. It's like this complex lattice structure, the salt, and it's a repeating crystalline structure pattern. But basically, the sodium's positive and the chlorine's negative. So I see for every positive, there's a negative. Okay. But it's this lattice structure. When I throw it in water, the water comes in and it essentially, through kinetic energy, dislodges the ions and surrounds them. And what we notice is that the negative anion of chloride is actually surrounded. And if you remember with the water, right, because we talked about molecular geometry and polarity, remember the oxygen is partially negative, the hydrogen is partially positive. So what we notice is around the anion, all the hydrogens, those are what's in white, are surrounding the anion. When we look at the sodium ion, all the partially negative oxygens are surrounding it to help stabilize it. And the ions don't mind because the water surrounds them. That's what dissolving is. Okay. So when you throw a salt in solution and it gets surrounded by water, that's basically what we mean soluble or dissolving or dissociating. Dissociating is the act of separating. Dissolving means it mixes evenly throughout. Soluble means it dissolves in water. Okay. What does that mean? Now the particles are free to move. Okay. So that also gives it a property of conductivity. Basically means it can conduct electricity. You may have heard the term electrolytes, like Gatorade, replacer electrolytes. That just means you're re replenishing essential minerals. What are essential minerals? Ions. Sodium, potassium, those are ions required in your body. So you're basically drinking salt water with some amino acids, a little bit of sugar, and food coloring. That's Gatorade. I mean, it tastes good. Don't get me wrong, but that's what you're drinking, okay? And the fact that the particles move, it's movement of charge is what electricity is. You learn that with the sodium potassium pump with uh, neuro uh, synapses. Okay. Again, this isn't a neuroscience course. I'm just trying to relate it. Okay. But the reason why I'm talking about this mobility is when the ions are free and separate, let's say in one beaker, right? And then in another beaker, if I put them together, now they can come in contact and produce something, okay? So the first is, is it gonna dissociate? And if it does, if it's a polyatomic ion, that's critical. Remember, they're held covalently. So the reason why nitrate travels as a group We did this Lewis dot structures, right? Trigonal planar. This nitrate, the nitrogen's held with the oxygens, not by ionic bonds, but by covalent. That's why it's traveling as its complete unit, okay? Why does it have a negative charge? Because to get everybody happy here, I needed one extra electron. Who did I take it from? Silver. 
Now silver has a charge and it dissociates, okay? So when will something dissolve? Well, sodium chloride is soluble, so the ions are separate. But silver chloride, you saw in that one precipitation reaction example, I wrote silver chloride as a solid. Why? Because if silver sees chloride in water, it'll grab it. It'll come out of solution and combine to it. Okay? So what does that mean? It means silver chloride's insoluble, doesn't dissolve in water. I mean, there's always a small amount, but the majority of it is going to form precipitate. It's actually a white precipitate. Um, doesn't look white here, but it is. <laughs> yeah. So soluble and insoluble salts, right? Soluble just means the salt, the ionic compound, the solid dissolves in water. Insoluble salt means if I have this salt and I put it in, if it's insoluble, it'll just settle to the bottom and it won't form a homogeneous mixture. It'll form a heterogeneous mixture because it'll be settling in two distinct, distinct layers. So here is some example. So cadmium sulfide, iron two sulfide, lead two iodide, nickel two hydroxide. These are all insoluble salts. How do I know? Well, there's the color change, but really that color is a suspension of particles that are solids that are coming in contact with each other and they're forming a precipitate. And if I let this sit over time, it will all settle to the bottom. Or I could speed the process up and not rely on gravity and centrifuge it and spin it, or then on a centrifuge, because it's angle and it's going at high speeds, it'll go to the bottom and pellet out. And then it'd be really easy to separate the solid from the liquid above the supernatant through decantation. So how do I know if a salt's gonna dissolve or not? Solubility rules, pretty much. So for this class, there's really, there's two major rules that I want you to know. I'm gonna go over all of them. It'll be helpful. But for my class, you, for this intro chem course, there's two rules I want you to focus on. That's like 80, that's gonna be like 80%, 85% of what you're gonna see in your book and everything. And then on tests and quizzes, I, I try not to make it too challenging, you know, as long as you understand. Okay, but I am going to cover all of them. So the first is you grab your periodic table, which again, this is your best friend. This is the world's best cheat. Yeah, it's not focusing. You're making me. Well, anyways, it's a periodic table and it's your best friend, the best cheat sheet in the world. If I look, lithium, sodium, potassium are all plus one because they're all group one or one A elements. Group 1A, they're always soluble in water. So what I'm showing you is what's soluble. Because if I know what's, it's way easier to know what's soluble and then everything else is insoluble. As opposed to trying to remember soluble and insoluble. Just focus on what's soluble. It's easier. Okay. So group 1A is always soluble. I put ammonium in there because it's a plus one, just like you know, lithium, sodium, potassium, and it's always soluble. And then the other group is that I want you to know is nitrates are always soluble. There's no exceptions, okay? There's also acetates, but really the nitrates, okay? Especially with double displacement. So the halides, so I call this halides, not halogens because they're an ionic form Ide. They're not neutral elements, right? So this would be iodine, a halogen, but that's elemental form with no charge. If I have an ion and it's dissolved in water, it's called iodide. So it's not a halogen, it's a halide. So group 7A is soluble, but there are some exceptions. Silver, Mercury one and lead two, okay? If it sees that, remember, what did I say? That the silver chloride preferred each other and formed a white precipitate. 
We also saw that the lead to iodide formed that pretty yellow precipitate. prefers partnering up with that than being surrounded by water. Sulfates are soluble as well, except calcium, strontium, barium, and lead, and that's lead too. And we saw that example was one of the first examples I wrote where barium sulfate produces a white precipitate, okay? Now, this is a lot. And basically what I want you to know, I mean, if you were taking a, a, you know, beyond a 100 level, you'll have to know this, you have to know all these, but for, for, for a 100 level, I would say no group 1A or, and nitrates are always soluble, okay? But if, you, if you're like some people, you want it all, you wanna know all of it, just cause you're a go-getter, I respect that. So I got, a na I got an acronym, NAG. So NAG is always soluble. What do I mean by NAG? Nitrates. Always soluble. Acetates. Always soluble. Group 1A. Always soluble. So you can think of NAGs as always soluble. But then there's some that are soluble with a few exceptions. SAG. I know this is really bad. Just bear with me. NAG, SAG. SAG. Sulfates. And the little, the reason why I put little a, it's just and. Group. 7A, those are your halides, chloride, bromide, and iodide. They're also soluble, but they have a few exceptions. For the sulfates, castro bear. I know you're, you're, bear with me. Castro, calcium, stronium, barium. They're all two plus because they're group two A. And, you know, there's a lead two, but castro bear, except PMS. Okay. So, lead two, mercury one, and silver. So, what are you remembering? If you want it all, you don't have to have it all. Okay. You could be happy with just nitrates and groups 1A, I told you. But if you want it all, you're remembering NAG, SAG, castro bear, PMS. So, so NAG, nitrates, acetates, group 1, always soluble. Sulfates, group 7A, the halides are soluble, except sulfates, castro bear, calcium, stronium, barium, lead 2. Group 7A halides, except PMS, lead, mercury, and silver. Okay? That's if you want it all. So now let's look at our reaction. So why is this aqueous? Well, what do we say? Group 1A potassium is what? Always soluble. So what do we notice? Potassium is going to be by itself aqueous. It's going to want to be by itself aqueous. Why is this soluble? Nitrates are always aqueous. Oh, here's aqueous. So. It doesn't matter that nitrate over here is with lead two. Okay, so in here, in this lead two nitrate, I got a bunch of lead two and nitrates because nitrate is always soluble. The potassium iodide that I'm adding, the potassium and the iodide is always soluble. But as soon as I mix the two and the iodide sees a lead two, it forms a precipitate. Why? Well, NAG, SAG, Castro Bear PMS, the SAG group, 7A, your halides, fluoride, bromide, 
iodide are soluble except PMS, and the P stands for lead two. So if these see lead two in solution, they form precipitate. Now, all, all I would need to do is just, just tell you, hey, you have these two, and you form a solid. And then you would do the dosi do and determine, hey, group 1A is always soluble. It can't be potassium nitrate. And then by default, you would know lead iodide. OK? So that's how you would predict it, right? No, I don't like how they did it on this overhead. I like writing it like the K plus I minus lead two plus nitrate minus. And then when I do it this way, I see that this is a possible precipitate. This is a possible precipitate. If I told you this was a precipitation reaction, it can never be this. Why? Group 1A and nitrates, the only two rules I really want you to know are always soluble. So this has to be aqueous. So by default, if this is the other product and I'm telling you there's a precipitate, this has to be the solid. Deductive reasoning. It's really good, especially with multiple choice. So let's, let's do a little sample. Let, let's see you know, how we're doing here, right? So potassium hydroxide, if I throw that in water, will it dissociate into ions and dissolve? Well, what's potassium? Group 1A. So it's soluble. Group 1A is always soluble. I know I, but if I throw silver, just think silver, right? That's a heavy metal. And now it's with the halide that's insoluble because even though halides, right, the SAG, group 7A are soluble, PMS, right, here's the silver and the PMS is an exception, okay? Calcium chloride, it's soluble. Why? Halides, group 7A, are soluble except what? PMS, lead, mercury, silver. This is calcium, that's neither, so that's soluble. Okay, now we have a heavy metal like lead too, but what is it attached to? Nitrates. Nitrates are always soluble. Now we got lead to sulfate. Okay, sulfates are soluble except Castro bear, and I also added lead to that heavy metal. Castro bear stood for calcium, steronium, and barium, but it's also lead too. So this is insoluble, okay? So you have to be able to, to know what's soluble and insoluble to figure out which one's gonna be the precipitate. Now, I, always, I won't always ask you to, I, I might just say, hey, a precipitate form, determine the products, and then you could just use group 1A and nitrates to determine it, okay? So what do I mean? Let's write a balanced equation for each of the following double displacements, okay? So I have aqueous aluminum acetate. So aluminums, a three plus acetate is C2H3O2 minus, and it's added to potassium, right? Potassium sulfide. So when I do the crisscrosses, I get aluminum acetate. There's three acetates to one aluminum because it has a three plus charge. There's two potassiums to one sulfide because it has a two minus. When I look at this, acetates are soluble. NAG, nitrates, acetates, group 1A. So aluminum acetate is soluble. Potassium sulfide is soluble too. Why? Group 1A, it's always soluble. So now I have to predict products. How do I do that? Remember the dosi do. -si -do. So the potassium and the acetate are going to mix, and the aluminum and the sulfide are going to, right? So when I do that, there's one potassium to one acetate because it's a plus one minus one. Why is this aqueous? Group 1A is always soluble. I'm telling you that this is a double displacement, let's say precipitation. 
three plus two minus, so I'll write it over here, three plus two minus crisscross, there is aluminum sulfide. Nag, sag, castor River does not include sulfide. That's a precipitate. So what's next? I need to balance it. Can I balance it? Of course. First, start with metals. Okay. So I'm going to start with aluminum. One aluminum. Uh-oh. I have two. So I need to put a two on this side. Then I go two potassium, only one. So I put a two. Then I go to ions. I see, or anions, non-metals. One sulfide. Oh, wait, there's three. So I need to put a three. But as soon as I put that three there in front of the potassium, right, because I had three sulfides. I had one here. I put a three to balance the sulfide. Now, how many potassiums do I have? Three times two, six. Got to go over to the product side and now put a six there. And now I see that I have six acetates. So three acetates and aluminum acetate times two is six. I'm balanced. Let's try another one. So barium chloride. Two plus CO minus and ammonium carbonate. So I'm going to crisscross, and I see that there's two chlorides per barium, two ammoniums per carbonate. Barium chloride's aqueous. Why? Group 7A soluble, except PMS. Ammonium is like group 1A because it has a plus one charge and it's soluble, so it's aqueous. Now I need to predict products. Barium 2 plus, Cl minus, ammonium, and carbonate. That's going to be one compound. That's going to be another. So the ammonium chloride plus one minus one is a one-to-one -one ratio. The barium carbonate two plus two minus is also a one-to-one -one ratio. The ammonium chloride is aqueous, but the barium carbonate, because carbonate's not on the list as a solid. It's not the NAG, SAG, Castro, Bear, PMS. So again, I would make it obvious by saying there's a precipitate, okay? So I would tell you, hey, this is a precipitation reaction, balance it out. So at this point, to balance it, one barium on the reactant, one on the product, then I might go to the ammoniums. I see there's two. I put a two. So now there's two chlorides, two chlorides, one carbonate, one carbonate. I'm balanced. So there is a case where you may not have a reaction. Okay, so what do I mean? Lithium phosphate potassium sulfate, okay? So I'm gonna crisscross and I get lithium phosphate, three lithiums because it's plus one to one phosphate, two potassium to one sulfate. And when I do the do -si do right? I'm going to need two lithium per sulfate, three potassium per phosphate, but these are aqueous. Why? Both of them have group 1As. So really, there's no reaction here, okay? But if you want to practice balancing, I have three lithium here, two common denominator, six, so I put a three and a two. I have two potassium here, a three here. So two 
three. Now I have three sulfates, three sulfates, two phosphates, two phosphates unbalanced. But in reality, there's no reaction. You don't even need to balance it. As soon as you predicted the products are both the lithium sulfate and the potassium phosphate, potential products rather, and I had group 1A for both of the metals, then I could have just stopped right there and just gave this as my final answer. No reaction. So why do I hit solubility rules, dissolving and aqueous so hard? Well, single displacement. It's another example of an aqueous reaction, which means what? It's gonna take place in solution. So here's a general equation. So here's an example. Oh, that it's too bad that that went like that. I'm sorry about that. Really, the hydrogen gas should be here. So what happens? The magnesium kicks the hydrogen out. So now the new element is my hydrogen. Hydrogen by itself in elemental form is a diatomic. That's why it's H2 and it's found as a gas. And then I have magnesium chloride as a salt. To balance this, one magnesium, one magnesium. One hydrogen, two hydrogen, I put it to two. Two chloride now, two chloride unbalanced. Here's another example. I have an element. It kicks out one of the elements in the compound, and I form a new compound and a new element. Notice the magnesium and the magnesium chloride forms a two plus charge. What is it doing? It has two valence electrons that it wants to get rid of. The hydrogen and the hydrochloric acid, if I split it up, are two H pluses. The magnesium is a metal. It wants to form a two plus charge. So it forces the hydrogen to take those two electrons. And when it does that, now the hydrogens don't have a charge and they don't dissolve very well in water if they don't have a charge. So what do they do instead? They combine, produce a bond, and bubble out of solution. When I go to this situation, you could look at it as, all right, this is copper two sulfate, so this has a two plus charge. This has a zero charge, but it has two balanced electrons. It forces those two on the copper. Now copper takes those valence electrons, doesn't have a charge anymore because it's an elemental form. This forms a two plus and it dissolves in solution and it's happy. But you could have it with halogens. And what I mean by halogens, non-metals. Okay, so metals like to form positive charges. So they're kind of fighting each other to form these positive charges. Non-metals like to form negative charges is kind of the opposite, right? So metals like to lose electrons, non-metals like to gain, right? So here's chlorine in elemental form, it's neutral. Bromide is negative here. And what happens? This is gonna kick the bromide out, take the electrons from the bromide. Now the bromide is gonna be neutral and I'm gonna have a negative charge here. Okay. So how can we determine if a metal is gonna kick out another metal or a hydrogen, right? Because one of my examples was the metal was kicking out the hydrogen. Remember the hydrogens form in a cation like metals. I'm giving you a handout, it's called an activity series. And basically this ranks the activity of metals. What that means is which one is most reactive. What that means is which one's the best at losing electrons, because that's what metals wanna do. They wanna lose electrons. So the higher you up on this hill, the better the more reactive you are, the better you are at losing electrons. So potassium loses electrons the best on this hill. But if I look, is zinc better than hydrogen? So I find zinc and I see, oh, zinc is better 
at losing electrons. It's more reactive. So what does that mean? The zinc is going to displace this hydrogen. So the new element's going to be what? Hydrogen gas. Right, because I'm kicking out hydrogen and it's a diatomic. And what will be left? Zinc chloride. Zinc is always two plus. It's one of the exceptions to transition metals. Chloride's minus one, so I get this and it's aqueous. Now all I need to do is balance it. And that's actually why I have a two here. This is balanced. What about iron and copper? Well, I take a look. Iron is higher than copper. So what does that mean? The iron's gonna kick out the copper. So the new element is gonna be copper by itself, metal, and I'm gonna produce, and this is tricky because there is iron two and three, but we're gonna make it easy. It produces iron two chloride. It keeps the same charge as the copper. and then that's balanced. So you can use that activity series to help you. So in this case, is the sodium gonna kick out the aluminum? So I picked one a little bit harder. So I look, where is aluminum? It's right here, but believe it or not, sodium's even higher. So that means the sodium's gonna kick this out, which means I'm gonna have aluminum as a solid. But for the sodium nitrate, the formula is Na, the nitrate's three, NO3 minus, so it's a one-to-one. -one. How do I know this is aqueous? Because nitrates are always soluble. How do I know that this is aqueous? Halides are soluble except PMS. Lead, mercury, silver, copper, and iron are neither of those, okay? So when I balance this, I see that I have three sodium, right? And then I have three nitrates. So three sodium, three nitrates, and I'm balanced. So what's going on with displacement? The zinc sees the copper, because really this is a copper two chloride solution. This is my copper two plus. And these are my chlorides. When I put it in solution, the zinc, and, and they don't do a great job of this. Basically, my zinc, this is my zinc. It's kind of breaking off into an ion and forcing electrons onto the copper, and the copper plates this, copper plated. So it's pushing those electrons on there. So what's happening? Well. I'm moving electrons around. So reactions involving a transfer of electrons are called oxidation reduction or redox reactions. Redox reactions occur if one of the following applies. A substance reacts with oxygen because oxidation. If I react with oxygen, I'm oxidized. So anytime you have a metal combining with oxygen to produce a salt, that's an oxidation. We saw that in the very beginning when I had magnesium as a solid plus O2 gas yields two MgO solids. That's an oxidation. This is reacting with molecular oxygen, elemental form. A metal reacts with a nonmetal. Oh, well, magnesium's a metal, oxygen's a nonmetal. There's an example right there. One substance transfers electrons to other. That's what those single displacement reactions are doing. We're seeing one of the elements say, I want to go in solution. So it kicks out the other element by either transferring its electrons or, or basically taking. So the acronym you should try to remember, and it's really goofy, Leo the lion goes grr. It's goofy because lions, they don't go grr, they go roar. I mean, unless they're the cowardly lion of the Wizard of Oz or something, but Leo the lion goes grr. It's goofy. There's other ones. It's the one that I use. And the reason being, Leo the lion goes grr basically stands for if I lose electrons, 
um, oxidized. If I gain electrons, um, reduced. So any substance that loses electrons is oxidized, any that gains. Who likes to lose electrons? Metals. Why? They only have a few valence electrons. Who likes to gain electrons? Non-metals. Why? They're really close to the noble gases and only need a few more to fill their octets, their S and P sublevels. So if one substance loses, it's oxidized, and then it has to reduce something. So the other substance is reduced. So here's an example. This is a combination. How do I know? I have two things coming together to form one. This is the only type that I would expect you to figure out as far as if I didn't give you the product. So if I just said, write out the reaction for calcium combining with sulfur, you would have to say, okay, well, calcium would combine with the sulfide ion and produce calcium sulfide, which is a salt, which is solid at room temperature. But what you're noticing is that the calcium has a zero charge as an element, but in the product, it has this two plus. So what did it do? How does calcium go from a solid to a neutral or to an ion, right? How does it do that? What does it have to do? It has to lose two electrons. So if it lost two electrons, which is what metals want to do, and we know it's going to lose two because it's in group 2A, it's oxidized. Well, what about, you know, sulfur? Well, sulfur, like I said, has, it's a neutral element, right? But in the product of sulf calcium sulfide, it has a two minus. So what did it do? It took the two electrons that the calcium gave up when it was oxidized, it took those, it gained those, and became reduced. And that's reduction. So you have an oxidation with the reduction, and that's the other type of reaction that they talk about, redox. And there's more than one type. But, well, we just saw the single displacement. Zinc as an element is neutral, but over here in this compound, oh, this would be aqueous, I'm sorry. It's a zinc two plus. So what did I do? I had to lose two electrons. So that means I'm oxidized. Copper in this is a two plus. How do I know? Well, each chloride is minus one and there's two. So this is two plus, but over here it's neutral. So what did I have to, to go from a two plus to neutral means I gained two electrons on the deuce. So again, metals like to lose electrons and be oxidized. So why is copper being reduced? Because zinc is more active as a metal, more reactive. It's higher on the activity series. So it forces copper, which is already happy in solution with a positive two charge. It forces its electrons. It forces it out of solution because zinc is better at being oxidized and it wants to be dissolved more than the copper. Here's another example of a redox. Magnesium is neutral, oxygen is neutral, but over here, magnesium is two plus, oxygen is two minus. So what do I see? You know, each magnesium is losing two electrons, so it's oxidized. Each oxygen is gaining two electrons, so it's reduced. So of your five basic types, the reason why I don't want you to just say it's a redox reaction is because four of the five are redox, combustion, combination, decomp, single displacement. The only one that isn't is your double displacement. So you can't just say redox, <laughs> but I want you to be able to identify if it's a redox reaction. Okay, you know it's going to be four of the five, but you might be asked, oh, if I break down parts, 
is it oxidized or reduced? So if I look at A, I see tin metal in elemental form. If it's an element, it's neutral, just like a molecule. I go from a four plus from neutral. How did I do that? I lost, right? It gave away four electrons. So Leo goes Ger. If I lose electrons, what does that mean? I'm oxidized. What happened here? I went three plus and I gained one electron and I only go to a two plus, so I still have a charge, but I've reduced my charge from a three plus to a two plus. This actually happens in a lot of your cytochromes and in the electron transport chain. It happens with hemoglobin and things like that, where iron is necessary. But what we're seeing is that this is a reduction. Why? It gained one electron, so now it's reduced. And what about here? I go from zero to a negative one. That means I did what? I, no, that's a mistake. This should be reduced. I'm gaining electrons, so I am reduced. Okay. Apologize for that. It must have been a late night. So that is reduced. What if I have an entire reaction written out? Can I figure out what's being oxidized and reduced? Well, magnesium. It's an element. It's no charge. But over here, it's 2 plus. So that means the magnesium did what? Lost two electrons. That's why if you lose negativity, you become positive. So what does that mean? It's off, lose, Leo goes Ger. If I lose electrons, I'm oxidized. So the magnesium's oxidized. What about the hydrogen? Here it's a hydrogen ion, it's plus one, and I go to zero. So what happened? I'm actually reduced, I gained one electron, which means I'm reduced. So the hydrogen ion, which we call protons, is reduced. Aluminum, here it's neutral. Over here it's three plus. What did I do? I lost three electrons, so I am what? Oxidized. Bromine went from zero to minus one. I gained one electron, so the bromine is reduced. Oxygen zero. I said iron zero. So what do I go? Now here, you, you don't have to, it's not obvious, but this is a three plus, two minus, but from zero to three plus, the iron lost electrons, so this is oxidized. The oxygen went from zero to two minus, so this oxygen is reduced. So this is a very good stopping point um, for where we are. I'm gonna stop, I wanna thank you for your patience. You know, this is, uh, this is tough. We're breaking this down piece by piece, but we are done with the five basic types of reaction, combustion, combination, and decomposition was the first lecture. Today, we focused on the more difficult ones, which were double displacement, which are neutralization and precipitation, and then the single displacement, in my opinion, are the most challenging. And then we said, okay, the double displacement and the single displacement are aqueous reactions, so we had to talk about solubility rules. And then we talked about how four of the five reactions are actually redox reactions and how we can identify it using the acronym Leo Goes Gur. So in our next lecture, we will take everything we've learned and we will begin to quantify reactions to determine how much product can be produced based on starting materials, similar to following a recipe. So I wanna thank you. And I'll see you next time.